Good morning and welcome to McNabb. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Friends, it's been a very sad week for our church family as we've lost a dear friend and one of our newest members, Kayla Bodden. It was only three Sundays ago that we welcomed Kayla into membership and she read the scriptures for us in that service. After the bravest of battles with cancer, Kayla passed away at the age of 26 and our hearts break in losing her so soon. Our thoughts and our prayers continue for her son, her parents, her sisters, and the rest of her family. So we acknowledge that our hearts are especially heavy as we worship this morning. And for me, I can't think of a better place to start than to simply remember and rest in some of the promises of God. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 103. And I invite you to reflect with me as we consider some of the words of that song. And following that, Christina will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you his servants who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, my soul. Let us join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning, choir. Good morning, friends. This has been a little bit of a difficult week for some of us here at McNabb. And as most of you know by now, one of our friends lost his mom this week. And that's a different way of saying that she passed away or even another way of saying that she died. And it's kind of sad news. Well, it's not kind of sad news, it is sad news. And we're very sorry to hear that news. And I want to talk to you a little bit about what you might be feeling. For some of us, we're really sad and it hurts our hearts because we love our friend very much and we care about him. And we know how much he loved his mom and how much he cared about her. And some of us might be feeling really sad because we knew his mom and we loved her and we cared about her very much. There's lots of different reasons to be sad. Maybe you didn't know his mom and so maybe you're not feeling sad and you know what? That's okay. 
there's lots of different things that we feel when somebody dies and it's okay. You don't have to feel sad. You don't have to feel happy just because everyone else around you feels happy when you feel sad. It's okay for you to feel whatever you're feeling. And you might not be sad today, but you might be sad next week. You might be sad next month. You might be really sad today and you might be happy next week and you might be happy next month. It's okay. I want to encourage you guys to just talk to the adults that are around you about the way that you're feeling. If you are feeling sad for your friend, for our friend, you can maybe draw him a picture and ask your adults to mail it to him. Or if you need to talk to someone, you can talk to the adults in your home. You can talk to me. You can talk to Steve. There's lots of different things you can do. You know, it's sometimes really hard to understand how something like this could happen. And we want to ask God, hey, what were you thinking? How come my friend's mom had to die? And that's okay. It's okay to ask those kinds of questions. And again, you can talk to your adults or you can talk to me or you can talk to Steve about those questions. I want to just remind you, the Bible never ever tells us that we're going to be happy all the time and that things are always going to be fine no matter what. It would be really nice if it did, but it doesn't. What it does say is that God loves you. God loves our friend. God loves his mom. God promises that he will always, always be with us. And you know what? God is sad too. God doesn't want us to be sad. So I just want to encourage you, keep praying, keep talking to God, Keep feeling your feelings and don't forget to reach out. You have a whole church community who loves you and cares for you very much. As has become our tradition during online services, Val is going to share with us um, before she reads the scripture for us this morning. Thanks, Christina. I've only been a member of McNabb Church for a few years, but my connection to McNabb started way back in the 1970s and 80s. I danced and eventually taught Scottish country dancing every week at McNabb and attended monthly dances there. And also because of my long friendship with John and Gina Middleton, I went to every candlelight service that the choir did at Christmas. And another event that I attended regularly were the burn suppers that John emceed. I remember one year when I was taking part in the burn supper, I was reciting a Scott sermon at the burn supper. The minister at the time, Dr. Johnson, insisted that I wear one of his robes for my performance. So when I was looking for a new church to attend, I chose McNabb. I became reacquainted with old friends. I made new friends. And I found that Steve and the family of McNabb welcomed me from the start. So. I'm happy to call McNabb my church home. This morning, we begin to consider the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Our reading begins with Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we 
being led by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. As today we're considering the first fruit of love, let us remember Paul's description of love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Thanks very much, Val. It doesn't take a botanist to tell you that you can determine a tree by the fruit on its branches. Fruit is a visible, easily identifiable display of what a tree is. And from where I sit, trees seem to grow their leaves or their flowers or their fruit almost effortlessly. At least to my observation, it just happens naturally. For the next several weeks, we are gonna be considering the fruit of the Holy Spirit described in Galatians chapter five. Nine characteristics that are to be a part of our lives. But in considering this fruit, we might wrongly assume that like fruit on a tree, these characteristics will just naturally appear in our lives as we passively watch it happen. But passivity is not the language of this passage. This fruit is more like the fruit of one's labors or one's efforts. We have a part to play in this game. And when I talk this way, some may object because we know that God's love is undeserved. It's not like we can do anything to earn God's love. God's love is freely given by him and receiving this love has nothing to do with our efforts. But what we are dealing with here is not a requirement of receiving God's love, but rather an outcome of receiving God's love. So Galatians chapter five is saying, if you've received and are living in the light of this love, your life is gonna start taking on a different shape. And you are not a passive bystander, but rather an active participant. And this idea comes up repeatedly in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16 says that we are to live by the Spirit. Verse 18 says, if you are led by the Spirit, and for me to be led infers that I am actively following. And verse 25 tells us that we are both to live by the Spirit and also be guided by the Spirit. So we have a role. We participate being led by, living by, and being guided by the Holy Spirit. And we are in turn to bear the fruit of the Spirit in the form of these nine characteristics. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Last week, we reflected on this bizarre season of 2020 that we have just lived through. And now, 2021, that we are continuing to live through the restrictions that we have to observe due to the pandemic. And this past year and the foreseeable future sometimes feels like just one prolonged wait, waiting for things to get back to normal. And we can equate time waiting as time wasted. So last week in that light, we considered the life of a man named Simeon, who probably spent a lot of his time, a lot of his life waiting. He was waiting for the fulfillment of a promise that he would behold the Messiah. That meant getting to see Jesus before he died. And we saw last week how that finally happened for Simeon, that uh, Simeon was able to hold the infant Jesus when he was 40 days old, when Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple to be consecrated. But it seems like so much of Simeon's life was just spent waiting. But as he waited, we saw that Simeon's life was characterized by humbly living out his trust in the promises of God, living in devotion to God and expressing this through treating people with love and grace accordingly. Behind all of this was Simeon's attentiveness 
to the Holy Spirit in his life. And the language, although a little bit different in Luke chapter 2 describing Simeon, is very similar to Galatians chapter 5. We come across three verbs again in Luke chapter 2 where it says that the Holy Spirit rested on Simeon, verse 25. Verse 26 says that it had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit. And verse 27 says that he was guided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that perfect self-giving love that flows between God the Father and God the Son. And that self-giving love formed the fabric of Simeon's life and transformed what might have appeared to be time waiting and maybe time wasted. It transformed that into time invested in trusting God and serving others. So for us, this series on the fruit of the Holy Spirit is about us cultivating that same awareness and devotion that might inform and energize our lives in a way that also blesses others. And yes, in a period of our lives where it just feels like we're waiting. We may be waiting, but we are to be anything but passive, starting with this morning's first fruit, the fruit of love. When I talk about love, we need to be careful in distinguishing what love is. Our culture popularly leans towards thinking about love as simply a good feeling, a good feeling that I have about someone or even something. Folks not only say that they love their spouse or their family or their friends, they also use the word to describe how they feel towards pizza or golf. Love is reduced to describing what makes us feel good. And with that, it's easy to think of love as something that just kind of happens, like you have no control over it, similar to those feelings of attraction or infatuation that just happen when it comes to romantic love. Another way that love is popularly thought of is that it is a kind of transaction. Yes, I will love you, but that's conditional upon you loving me back. And Jesus even talks about that kind of love in the Sermon on the Mount. I might add, encouraging us not to settle for that kind of love. Both of these definitions of love, love as a feeling and love as a transaction, although they may exist within a love relationship, fall short of the love that we are being called to here. There are four different Greek words in the Bible that are translated with our English word, love. Four different kinds of loves, as it were, are described. The word storge, which is translated love, refers to simply affection that we might have towards someone, something. The word philos, which is also translated love, refers to friendships. The word eros, which is also translated love, refers to romance. But the fourth word, agape, which is also translated love, is the word used to describe God's self-giving love and this first fruit of the Holy Spirit. This word goes beyond feelings, affection, and transactions to describing the unconditional love of God. This love beyond mere feelings or transaction calls us to choose to act in others' best interests, regardless of what we may or may not get back. That's why Jesus even invites us, calls us to love our enemies. The word love in the Bible is not about what we feel, it's about what we do. It's a verb, it's an action. And because it is self-giving, it acts by giving to others. Perhaps the most popular verse of the Bible, John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So for us, to realize this first fruit of the spirit in our lives, is going to involve embracing this self-giving love of the Holy Spirit. And the applications are probably endless. So I'm simply going to zero in on one this morning. In order to be practical, I want to finish today looking at a real life, very hard situation where the love of Jesus was observed by those who stood by. Their exact words concerning Jesus in John chapter 11 Verse 36 were these, see how he, Jesus, see how he 
loved him. The context was in Jesus weeping at the grave of his friend Lazarus. I think some versions of the Bible translate it with only two words. John chapter 11, verse 35, according to some versions, just simply say this, Jesus wept. And although that verse may be short, it also represents something very powerful. Why? Well, when Jesus came to Bethany, that's where his friend Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha lived, when Jesus came to Bethany after his friend Lazarus died, Jesus came knowing, at least I believe, that he was going to perform the miracle of bringing Lazarus back to life. He, he told his puzzled disciples earlier in John chapter 11, when he announced that they were going to Bethany, he said this, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going there to awaken him. Falling asleep was the language of saying Lazarus had died. Paul uses the same language to describe people who have died in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So in telling the disciples that he is going to awaken Lazarus, Jesus knew what he was about to do. I believe he also signaled that in his conversation with Martha in verse 23 when he says, your brother will rise again. So Jesus, I would argue, knew that in just minutes he was going to bring Lazarus back to life. But he arrives in Bethany to a situation where both Mary and Martha are broken and being consoled by others who all appear to be broken as they mourn alongside those two sisters. Verse 33 records that when Jesus saw Mary weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he, Jesus, was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Now, remember, at least I would argue that Jesus knew in a few minutes, everything would be okay. Lazarus would be alive again. Everyone's sorrow was going to turn to joy. But let's keep reading. Verse 34. He, Jesus, said, Where have you laid him? Referring to the tomb where Lazarus' body lay. And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And it says in verse 35, Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. They took note of observing Jesus' love by the tears he shed. And, and I would suggest that those tears were the result of Jesus entering into and identifying with the pain of those who were grieving. As he observed, as he listened, as he dialogued, as he came alongside them, not as some distant bystander and not even as a miracle maker, at least at this point, but as one who showed in this case by his tears that he understood their pain. And in doing that, those who were present experienced his love. I wonder if we realize how important that is and if we're willing to seek to be that. For others and please remember I know that when I'm pointing one finger preaching there are three pointing back at me if we are going to communicate love after Jesus example here we need to be willing to take the important time to listen to observe to invest our energy our time our attention in coming alongside of others even in their pain not to necessarily rush to pat answers that might not even be heard or even be helpful. And we all know that some of life's hurts don't have answers. In this passage, the love of Jesus simply felt with them what they were feeling and let them know that they weren't alone, that he was with them through it and in it. Maybe this is one of the sacred starting points for us in loving one another, to the best of our flawed abilities to do the important job of listening, of joining with others in their hurt and their vulnerability, and communicate that we understand and that they aren't alone. Whether it's in situations of loneliness and isolation, like many of us are presently struggling with, whether it's emotional stress or sickness, which many of us are struggling with, or grief. 
when I reflect on the hardest moments of my life. I remember people who have come alongside me, not with a quick answer, not who could take away the hardship or the pain, but I knew they were there with me. And because of that, because of that, I experienced their love. Perhaps we can find a way to show this love to someone this week. And I'd invite you to take some moments now to reflect on how you can actively share this love, the first fruit of the Holy Spirit with others. Please reflect as our gathering band sings, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Thanks so much, Gathering Band. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Father, we thank you that you invite us to live by, to be led and guided by the Holy Spirit in our lives, even in these challenging days. We pray, Father, that the fruit of love might be demonstrated through our choices to give. And as you direct, we pray that you would help us to let others know that they are not alone. In that light, Father, there is someone that each of us needs to pray for at this time. So we bow in silence to remember them. Father, thank you that you hear us and that you help us. We want to share your love with others. And we pray, Lord, all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for our worship. Following the service, there is a Zoom Coffee Fellowship at 1045. If you'd like to receive the link to attend that, just write me at mcnabstreet at gmail.com or write me at the same address if you want to be added to our mailing list to receive weekly updates about what's happening here at McNab. And now may the Lord go before you to lead you. May the Lord go behind you to protect you. May the Lord go beneath you to support you. May the Lord go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord together. Amen.